Okay, so very warm welcome to everyone in this bright town. And uh, yeah, thank you for being here. It's a very convivial atmosphere, especially from the organizers who've helped us, Corky and Co. <laughs> from Brighton Bodhi Tree, isn't it? And uh, yeah, the tea and the coffee and the chocolate and the sangha. So um, it's really lovely to be here and also to welcome our teacher, Ajahn Brahmali, who arrived precisely one day ago all the way from Australia. And um, I heard that some of you were coming tonight just because there's a Dhamma talk, but you didn't know who we were or who was coming to give the talk. So thank you for your confidence. I think you've um, probably uh, made a good decision, I hope. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to welcome everybody and especially welcome Ajahn Brahmali. Um, he's been supporting Anukampa Bhikkhuni project for many years and coming over to teach retreats for us. And uh, for those who don't know what we are up to, we are, well, I particularly, and also Venerable Upeka, who's come to join me in the last couple of years, are trying to establish a monastery for women to take full ordination as Buddhist monastics. And believe it or not, it's the very first opportunity women have had in this country, in the whole of the UK, and one of very, very few monasteries that um, are going to take aspirants who wish to pursue monastic life in Europe and in the world and just uh, this March, I can hardly believe it, <laughs> we moved into a beautiful property on Boar's Hill in Oxford, near Oxford, but a really rural and quiet place that's suitable for practice and suitable hopefully for um, training nuns. So that's what we're about and of course the wider purpose of that is just to spread the teachings of the Buddha. So you know, not only meditation techniques and practices, but also the whole of the path, the whole of the Eightfold Path that includes the way that we relate to one another, you know, our livelihoods, our speech, our um, ethical conduct in general, and view, right view. So our aim really in this monastery is to practice the whole of the path as close to as we can possibly understand as the Buddha taught. So um, yeah, with that little introduction and also a warm invitation, to all of you to stay connected to what we're doing, um, I'd like to invite Ajahn Pramali to start maybe yeah. with some meditation. Okay, or okay. Would you like to begin? Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, let's do some meditation together. Is that okay? Are you ready for that? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's always nice just to kind of chill, chill out a little bit huh? and then get down to the Dhamma talk afterwards. So just please uh, relax, close your eyes. Uh, and uh, one of the nice things about closing your eyes is that you remove so much of the world uh, from your mind uh, and you can focus on uh, the meditation practice instead. Uh. And one of the uh, critical things in meditation is to make sure that you are at ease uh, and at ease usually starts with the body, uh, the body being relaxed uh, and then as you relax the body it tends to have an effect on the mind as well. Uh mind and body being so closely connected to each other. Uh, if you relax one, uh, you also relax the other. Uh, so just take time. Uh, just be kind of gentle and kind with yourself uh, and just allow your body to relax. Uh, The beginning of meditation is always about just simply letting go, uh, letting go especially of the world, letting go of all the daily activities uh, and just kind of uh, enjoying just being here in a good company, in a peaceful place, uh, enjoying the idea of the spiritual practice, uh, 
And so just kind of allow the mind, allow the world to fade away from your mind. Uh, and the best way to do that is just to uh, be very patient, uh, have a sense of delight in what is going on, uh, and then slowly, slowly the mind will let go of the worldly phenomena. Uh. Meditation always begins with the idea of establishing mindfulness. Uh, and mindfulness can be described as non-judgmental awareness, uh, where you just allow things to be. Uh, you don't try to push things away or to attract things. Uh, if you hear something outside, uh, you just allow it to go through you without any kind of resistance. Uh, and when there's no resistance within, uh, then there's also no echo within her. Uh, it comes in and it passes out again, leaving no trace. Uh, and this is the idea of mindfulness. Uh, you just sit back and enjoy her, uh, without judgment, without desiring, without uh, knowing what is right or wrong, uh, simply being aware uh,
One of the uh, critical things of meditation practice uh, is to enjoy every step of the path. Uh, and so as you go through this process of letting go and being aware, uh, make sure you also focus on the pleasant aspect of this. Uh, the pleasant aspect of just sitting back and doing nothing. Uh, the sense of being free of the burdens of life. Uh, and the sense of just doing something skillful, something wholesome. Uh, in good company with other people. Uh, and as you do that, as you enjoy the practice, you have the right attitude towards it. Uh, this is often one of the most powerful ways uh, of gaining that mindfulness that we're trying to achieve. Uh, And uh, now just take a moment to review your meditation here tonight. Uh, and if you do feel a bit more peaceful and calm, uh, ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, how does this calm and the peace and the enjoyment, uh, how does it come about? Uh, and as you learn how to understand the meditation and the causes of these things, uh, you start to be able to take charge of your own practice. Uh, Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> it's a very nice sound, isn't it? It's beautiful. It's really, where does it come from?
Is it from here or is it from there? Yeah. From here. Yeah. We can just keep ringing the bell all night. Uh, yeah, keeps on going. Uh. Very nice. Okay. Uh. Okay. Let's have some coffee to get ready for this heavy Dhamma talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everyone. Uh, so, once again, welcome. Uh, and uh, the uh, topics for tonight's talk is what is a jhana and what it is not, something like that, what it is and what it isn't. Uh, so does anyone, everyone here heard about the word jhana before? Uh, no? Okay, one who hasn't heard about it. Uh, okay, you've heard, heard it. Uh, okay, uh, so, uh, so the idea, the, just to kind of give you a very, very brief uh, introduction to the word jhana, the word jhana basically means like deep meditation. Uh, yeah, so a jhana is like a state when you become incredibly peaceful, uh, very joyful, very blissful, a very deep state of meditation. That's essentially what it is about. Uh, and it's a very fundamental part uh, of the Buddhist path. Uh, yeah, the Buddha talked about an eightfold path. Uh, and so this is one of the factors of the eightfold path. Uh, and this is why it is important to know what the jhana is and what it is not. Because if you don't know what it is, uh, you probably can't fulfill the Eightfold Path. Yeah? That means that there's no way you're going to be able to go all the way to the end of what the Buddha taught, uh, yeah? which is called awakening uh, uh, bodhi uh, in, the, uh, in the Buddhist uh, suttas, the Buddhist discourses. Uh, and so to be able to go all the way to awakening, all the way to the end of the path, we need to understand the steps. Uh, and if you don't understand the steps, uh, well, you have a problem. Uh, yeah? and that's kind of the idea here. Uh, Make sense? Yeah, it's kind of a very brief introduction to jhana. The rest of the talk is also going to be part of this, it's going to be more of the same, and it's going to be time to ask questions afterwards. So. Uh, jhana, the word jhana also means uh, it's, a, it's a noun which means meditation. The, the word, uh, the verb of jhana is jayati, and that means more meditation in general, the idea of uh, you know sitting down, watching your breath, and these kind of things. Uh, and so that's kind of the, uh, the background there. Uh. And uh, you may wonder, why should we talk about what jhana is and what it is not? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't know if you have, some of you may have seen this, if you go on the internet, uh, there's very often all these discussions about jhanas. Yeah, some people say it means this, other people say it means that, uh, some people say it means something in between, uh, and some people are kind of in a completely different ballpark, <laughs> yeah, in a different reality. Uh, and so what actually is it? Uh, that's the question, uh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and this is kind of the, uh, um, so what we're going to talk about precisely because there is so much discussion. Many of these discussions are very bad ideas uh, because very often when you discuss things, you end up with heated arguments and all of these kind of things. Uh, and of course, if you end up with heated arguments uh, and you're kind of ready to punch each other in, on the nose, uh, sometimes that's what it feels like when you go online. Uh, of course, that is very counter to the idea of jhana. There's no way you're going to get a jhana if that is what you do online. Uh, and so, it, in, in one sense, it's kind of very counterproductive to have these discussions. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, as I just mentioned, it is also very important to understand it. Uh, if you don't understand it, uh, there's no way that you're going to understand the path that the Buddha taught. And for that reason, it actually matters and it actually is actually quite significant. Uh, and that's the reason why we are talking about it today. I suppose is that the reason? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're, anyway, we're, yeah, so we're here to discuss it. Uh, and uh, the, I think a good place to start is uh, that even though these jhanas are very significant, it is important to understand them in the right way, uh, it is also important not to hold on to these things too much. Uh, yeah, sometimes people <laughs> say they go on a retreat uh, and they say, I've come to get a jhana. That's what they say, I've come to get a jhana. And I say, or Ajahn Brahm says, or someone says, but you don't know if you're going to get a jhana. If you're coming to get a jhana, you may have a problem. You have all of these aspirations, all these desires, you want to go somewhere, you may not be able to get it. What's going to happen then? <laughs> yeah, and you can see that there's a problem right there. If you aspire for something, if you have too much desire to go somewhere, that desire becomes a hindrance in actually getting to where you want to be, because desires tend to take us into the future. It takes us into, you know, a very restless mind very often, etc., etc. And so it blocks our ability to achieve these kind of states of meditation. And so for that reason, it can be kind of counterproductive if we give rise to, if we think about these things in the wrong way, and we aspire to these things in this way. So we have to be very careful how we, how we do this. And so the way 
to actually achieve these states uh, is to put into place all the causes. Uh, yeah, the causes, not, in other words, the other factors of the noble eightfold path, be kind, don't argue about John on, in, on the internet. Yeah, this is one of the causes of achieving it. Uh, and uh, as you do that, as you put in place the causes for these things, uh, then eventually they will happen as a consequence. Uh, make sense? Uh, yeah, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So put in place the idea here, put in place the causes. Don't worry about the results. Let the results happen when they will happen. Uh, don't force yourself. And this is kind of very different from the way the world works. Uh, yeah, if you have a job you have to do or something that you have to succeed in, whatever it is, uh, you kind of put forth a bit of willpower. Yeah, okay, I've got to write this report. I don't really want to write it, but I've got to write it. Okay, so willpower is the only way here. Yeah. On the Buddhist path is the opposite of willpower. Yeah? It's letting go of willpower, not kind of looking to the future, not trying to achieve things, uh, but being content with what happens. Uh, just putting in the causes, being kind, uh, being compassionate, uh, being mindful in the present moment, uh, having right view. Yeah, having right view is fundamental to the idea of the Buddhist path. Really, really fundamental. That's why it is the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah? are, you, are you all reasonably familiar with the Buddhist teachings? Uh, or a little bit, yeah? Noble Eightfold Path makes sense to everyone, huh? yeah? Not everyone? Yeah, okay, you haven't heard about the Noble Eightfold Path, right? Okay, so this is your chance to learn. Yeah, you're going to learn the most tonight. The one that knows the least is going to learn the most. That's kind of the great thing, yeah. <laughs> so that's good, huh? so welcome. Um, so Noble Eightfold Path begins with right view, and that is why it is so fundamental. And all the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path are supported by that right view. Yeah? So if you develop the right view, if you understand the world more uh, aligned with the way the Buddha talked about the world, which is supposed to be the way the world is, uh, yeah? then of course it's going to increase your ability to do everything else on that Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, so uh, we put the cause into place. Uh, and when you put the cause into place, then the results will happen. The meditation will happen. And eventually, the jhanas will happen. And eventually, awakening will happen. Huh? Are you ready for awakening? Huh? Yes? <laughs> okay. You're very brave, right? Because what is awakening? Yeah. We, don't, we don't know what it is. It's like, wow, awakening. It's like something like a pie in the sky. Something really extraordinary. Huh? But of course it is worthwhile. Yeah, according to the Buddhist teaching, awakening is the highest happiness. Uh, and if that is true, uh, obviously it is worthwhile. Uh, so putting in place the causes. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, and uh, basically you put all the cause into place uh, and then you don't do anything here. Uh, and this is kind of the hard part in Buddhism. What does it mean not to do anything here? Uh, and uh, uh, to il illustrate this, uh, I'm going to tell you a story from the life of the Buddha himself. Uh, have you read the life, the, the life of the Buddha, the story of the uh, background, how the Buddha became awakened and all of these kind of things? Uh, you know the story, yeah? And that, that story occurs in a number of different places. There's a story that occurs in later texts, uh, which is very elaborate, kind of elaborated kind of story, a lot of legendary things and mythology, etc., etc. But if you go to the actual word of the Buddha, what we call the suttas, the discourses of the Buddha, the Buddha talks about his own life before his awakening. Yeah? He tells basically us uh, what he did, uh, and then obviously meaning to say, this is what I did to reach awakening. Uh, you should be doing the same thing. Yeah? The Buddha is a human being. We are human beings. Uh, the path to awakening is the same for all of us. Uh, and so the Buddha tells us the story of his own life, like an autobiography, if you like. Uh, you should be doing the same thing. Yeah? And so this story... Part of the story is the Buddha going to these uh, 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 two teachers, yeah, and teachers very that teach very profound meditation. They call Alara Kalaman Udakramaputta, and these are kind of some of the foremost meditation teachers at that time. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you for supporting me here. Yeah. So, so some of the foremost meditation teachers in India at that time they were basically Brahmanical. Bra Brahmanism is the precursor to modern day Hinduism. And so very, very, very profound meditation. We talk about meditation where the world kind of completely disappears. Uh, the five senses are no more. Uh, the mind is completely unified. Uh, it's a kind of meditation when you get there, uh, you think you have acquired the meaning of life, unity with God. Uh, yeah, you don't want to do anything more. You just want to sit down, chill, and stay in that meditation for the rest of your life. That's really all you want to do when you get to these kind of things. Uh, and so the Buddha got to these meditations under these two teachers. Uh, and then he kind of said, no, it, this is, doesn't really work. Yeah, the whole rest of the world thought it works, uh, but the Buddha did not. The Buddha is always this kind of rebel. Uh, 
He had the Buddha as the black sheep. Is that true, the Buddha as a black sheep? It's interesting, yeah? This is not how usually Buddhism is taught, but I said the Buddha is a bit like the black sheep because if you are the white sheep, yeah, you follow everyone else. When everyone else goes over the cliff, so do you. But the black sheep turns around just in time yeah, and avoids the cliff. And so the Buddha avoids the cliff. And that is what awakening is about, avoiding the cliff. Yeah, you're ending kind of suffering. Yeah? And so to do that, you have to think differently from everyone else. So where everyone else finds the absolute meaning in life, the Buddha says, no, this just leads to more rebirth. It doesn't actually end the problem that I'm trying to end, which is the ending of suffering, which also means the ending of rebirth in Buddhism. And so the Buddha turns away from that. And then after turning away from that, uh, he practices these ascetic practices, yeah, often called self-mortification, the Atakalamatanu Yoga in the suttas. Uh, that's Pali. Anyone knows Pali? A little bit of Pali? Yeah. No? Yeah? Okay, Venerable here knows Pali. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So Pali is the language of the early suttas, uh, quite closely related to Sanskrit. Uh, and it's kind of useful for a monastic to know a little bit of Pali. So, uh, and, you, and it gives you, one of the reasons I say Pali words, uh, it gives me more authority. Uh, it sounds cool, right? If I say Pali words, I say, wow, you think, and I think, okay, so authority is kind of made. Uh, so this is called Atakalamatanu Yoga. Uh, the idea of self-mortification, in other words, like a tormenting of the body, the idea is to release kind of the soul or the self or the mind uh, by tormenting the physical body. That's kind of the idea behind that. Uh. And uh, so then he does that for a while, and then after doing that for a while, all the way to almost dying, uh, yeah, he's on the verge of dying, because if you, when, you become, when you do this practice all the way, you become so thin, uh, and you lose kind of everything, uh, and eventually you die. It's like, you know, fasting over very, very long periods of time. And so then he thinks to himself, he thinks, well, I've tried uh, these various ways. I've been living the household life, been indulging myself. Uh, you know, he had a very kind of plush upbringing, uh, yeah, very nice upbringing. Uh, and then he kind of did the meditation practices all the way to the limit, as they were known in those days. Uh, then he does the self-mortification all the way to the limit. Uh, he has tried everything in the world. Uh, none of these things in the world work. Uh, and so then he asks himself, uh, what then could be the path to awakening here? Uh, yeah, at this point, he has left behind everything here. Uh, and this is the idea of, again, having to be a black sheep. You have to really go your own way as a Buddha to be able to find the solution to the problems of life, because obviously no one else has found them. Uh, and so then he thinks back and he says, well, actually, uh, I remember as a child, uh, I was sitting under a rose apple tree, the Jambu Deepa. Uh, and as I was sitting under this tree, he was just a small, he was just a child. I don't know how old he was, I think 12 years old, according to the commentaries, but he was a child. Uh, his father was doing some work in the field or something, uh, and he was just waiting for his dad. Uh, yeah, and sitting in the shade of this tree. Uh, and as he was sitting in the shade of the tree, he went into a jhana. We're talking about jhanas, right? Uh, so he went into a jhana state. Uh, and now he recalls, now this is many, many years later, uh, he's very close to kind of reaching his own awakeness, this is maybe 15 years later or whatever, uh, he recalls that event. Uh, and then he thinks to himself, that is the path to awakening, that jhana state. Uh, yeah? And then based on that, later on, he then reaches awakening. Uh. So why am I telling you all this? Uh? And uh, the reason is, there's two, two reasons why I'm telling you all this. Uh, the first reason, and this is kind of, I think, extra, really interesting here. Uh, the first reason is that he was a child. Uh, he was sitting under a tree. He was just waiting for his father. Uh, and you can imagine as a child, yeah, you're just sitting there, you know, oh yeah, you know, the sky is blue and the sun is shining. You're sitting in the shade, really relaxed, doing nothing, being patient. You know what children are like, yeah, they're kind of, you know, they're playful and they're kind of just, uh, they, they have the ability to relax, yeah. Adults, we can't relax anymore, but children, they can relax. So they're just sitting there patiently, and he goes into a jhana. No doctrine, no idea of any religion, no kind of practice before, nothing. And still, you enter a jhana. Isn't that kind of extraordinary? Huh? To me, that is really interesting because it means that what, it, what we have to do to enter a jhana is nothing really. Huh? All you have to do is to be patient like that small child, huh? like supremely patient, fully patient, uh, having no idea where you're going, no desire, no aspiration, no kind of planning to go to any particular place, uh, but just chillaxing completely. Uh, and through that complete relaxation, these jhanas happen. Uh, that is how you attain a jhana state. Uh. Isn't that interesting? Uh? I find it really, really interesting. I, 
and it's not just that it's um, and, and this is kind of the thing if you you know if you ever talk to someone who is a really master of these kind of states uh, they would say very similar kind of things uh, many years ago we had a group of uh, uh, people i live in perth in australia yeah uh, i don't know if you said that venerable but that's where i live anyway whether you said it or not uh, so <laughs> so i live in perth in australia and very with my teacher is ajan brahm everyone knows ajan brahm yeah, everyone? No? Don't know Ajahn Brahm? Okay, good. So that, again, you're going to learn something. Ajahn Brahm is my teacher. Ajahn Brahm is a very, um, very uh, famous monk, yeah, these days. Uh, and he's kind of, many people would regard him as a meditation master, yeah, very deep meditation, all these kind of things. Uh, and he was a disciple of a very famous monk in Thailand called Ajahn Shah. Ajahn Shah was maybe the, maybe the most famous meditation master in Thailand in the 20th century. So it's like a, a nice lineage. And that lineage goes all the way back to the Buddha originally. Back to the Buddha over here. Yeah. <laughs> and so we have this large support base in Perth. Yeah, this is Australia, very close to Asia, very large Asian migration into Australia. Many of them are Buddhists. And so we have this beautiful community of people from the various countries in Asia, from uh, Thailand, Sri Lanka, uh, Burma, Laos, uh, uh, Vietnam, basically everywhere. And of course, then also the kind of more traditional Anglo-Saxon Australians as well. Yeah, everyone comes to our monastery. Yeah. And uh, sometimes then we go to, yeah, we go overseas. And what this one monk who also was a disciple of Ajahn Shah, Ajahn Brahm's teacher, yeah, he's actually Ajahn Shah's nephew called Ajahn Ganha. He came to stay with us for a while and people loved him. Yeah, he's just a beautiful monk, so much loving kindness, so much kindness, uh, uh, very peaceful um, uh, presence and all of these kind of things. Uh, and so after he had left, people were saying, oh, we should go and visit Ajahn Ganha. Yeah, it was so nice to be with him. Uh, and we can ask him some questions about meditation practice. Uh, and so we went, all of these people, they went from Perth uh, all the way to Thailand. Uh, I think Ajahn Brahm also was with them. Uh, yeah, and they went to Ajahn Ganha. And they said, we come all the way from Perth uh, to ask about meditation. Uh, please tell us about meditation practice. Uh, and so Ajahn Ganha says, uh, breathe in. Uh, Sabai, breathe out, sabai. And that was it. <laughs> but we come all the way from Perth. That's just all we're going to say. We, we want to hear more. And but breathe in, sabai. Sabai in Pali in Thai means something like relax, be at ease, be comfortable. Yeah, is that right, Venerable? Sabai, sabai. sabai, sabai. Be happy, yeah, be happy, be at content. Yeah, exactly. Like a ballpark, you're right. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so it means this idea, just, just be content and happy and comfortable and at ease, yeah? Breathe in, be at ease. Breathe out, be at ease. That's all you have to do, yeah? And then they wanted to hear more, but he wasn't going to say anymore. That was the whole teaching that he had, yeah? That was it. They come all the way from Perth to hear six words and I had to go back to Perth again. <laughs> That's kind of nice, isn't it? There's something about these great meditation masters that make things very, very simple usually. Very simple teachings, yeah? And don't make things complicated at all. Uh, and this is so, so beautiful about it, yeah? But you have to take that teaching really to heart and do it fully. You really have to be content. You really have to be relaxed. You really have to be at ease. Then it works. Just like the Buddha under the rose apple tree, yeah? Just chilling, uh, doing nothing at all. Uh, this is the idea. Uh. So isn't that kind of nice? Uh? Yeah, this is what the Buddhist path is about. Yeah, relaxing. There's no kind of sitting there and stressing. Oh, I've got to watch the breath. Yeah, wow, so much dukkha to watch the breath. If I keep on watching the breath, it will be all right eventually. But actually right now, it's really uncomfortable. Can't stand it, but I'll keep on carrying on anyway. Yeah. That is the wrong way. Yeah, <laughs> It doesn't work. Yeah. And then you have a big problem because of that. Yeah. And so this is the, uh, the one thing that really stands out to me. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you read the suttas and things kind of suddenly become clear. Oh, wait a minute, there's something really important about this. The child sitting there doing nothing, that is how you attain jhana. Yeah? That tells a lot. It says a lot about how these things actually happen. But there's one other thing to be learned from this, which I find really also very, very fascinating. And that other thing which is happening there is that what I just was, the story I was just telling here was the idea of the Buddha to be coming under these two teachers, uh, yeah, staying with them, uh, and then taking those teachings all the way to the most profound level, very, very deep meditations. Uh, yeah? But then, uh, when he was recalling later on, he didn't recall those teachings. Uh, he recalled the earlier teaching when he was a child. Uh. So why is that? 
Why didn't he recall the teachings under these very profound teachers? Uh, why did he have to go much further back in time to recall the time when he was a child? Uh, it is one of those conundrums that is talked about in Buddhist circles. Uh, have you talked about that before? Because uh, you, you, you look like you have kind of knowledge about the... I met you on the street, by the way. That's right. Yeah, that was really cool. I, it was very kind of you. You were going to take me here. I must, thank you very much. That was very... Yeah, you ended up getting lost yourself. So you were getting lost yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a bit of an overpromise on your, on your part. Yeah, say, I'm going to take you to the center. Okay, don't, don't trust everything you hear, in other words. <laughs> but I, I appreciate the kindness, though. That was very good of you. Yeah. And so why is that the case? Yeah. And uh, the answer is, and it's, it's a different answer, but I think one of the most profound answers to this question uh, is that when the Buddha learned meditation under those two existing masters, uh, that meditation came with a package of doctrines. Uh, and those doctrines, doc that doctrinal uh, package that it came with uh, is the doctrine of the ancient Brahmins. Uh, and that is about the permanent self. Uh, yeah, it's about being reborn or kind of attaining a realm where you kind of uh, are eternal, you cannot carry on forever after. Uh, and so it came with this doctrine that was basically wrong. Uh, yeah, a doctrine that didn't fit with the way the Buddha to be was starting to see the world. Uh, and so when he looked back to that, uh, all he could see was that wrong view, the wrong idea. And that's why he couldn't relate the meditation, the good meditation, to as a path, uh, but instead related it to the wrong view. Uh, and so the wrong view becomes a blockage for being able to see that profound meditation for what it actually is, part of the path. Yeah? And this, what is, what is so important about this, is that it shows us the danger of wrong view in Buddhism, how it blocks your ability to make progress in meditation. And eventually even the Buddha himself was not able to make use of those meditations because of the wrong view that was conjoined with those meditations. And that's why he had to go back to his childhood when he was free of views. No views, no doctrine, no nothing, just pure meditation experience, nothing else. Isn't that kind of fascinating? Yeah, it says something about the danger of looking at the world in the wrong way. And so what that means in a way, yeah, what this kind of, kind of comes down to is that when we talk about meditation, deep meditation, view, yeah, the way we think about the world, in other words, insight and all of these kind of things, always comes with meditation. Yeah, meditation and view, these two sides of one coin, if you like, always have to kind of be present for the meditation to work. And one way of thinking about that, yeah, is the two qualities we often talk about in meditation, samatha and vipassana. Has everyone heard about samatha and vipassana? Have you heard about it? No? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so it's good because then I have an excuse to talking about it, right? So thank you for being here. Otherwise, I have a problem right now. If you said yes, I know, what am I going to say here? Actually, I would have no problem saying anything. But anyway, just kind of making it up because it sounds, it sounds nice. So thank you for not knowing anyway. And I think the fellow with the red shirt also doesn't know, right? So, okay, good. So we have another reason there. So, so uh, samatha and vipassana. Yeah, so samatha... These are two sides of meditation practice. Samatha means calm or tranquility. This is the calming idea of meditation, which is a very important part of what meditation is about. Yeah? Jhanas ultimately lead to some of the deepest calm you can have. And vipassana, often translated as insight, but I don't think that is satisfactory translation. Vipassana means more something like clear seeing. Yes, in other words, uh, could, and I think the, the evidence from the suttas, from the word of the Buddha, is actually quite strong in that direction. Huh? And just to kind of uh, boost my credentials a little bit, huh? I wrote to Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Huh? You know Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi? Huh? Yeah, so I kind of, I, I write to him occasionally because uh, I, I know him, met him a few times. I wrote to him and said, actually, you know, you should change your translation of Vipassana to clear seeing. Yeah, this, forget about this inside stuff. Yeah, I don't think it's right. So I gave my argument. Uh, and then he wrote back to me and he said, actually, I agree with you. I thought, wow, he agrees with me. Okay, that's really nice. Yeah, when a senior monk agrees with me, that's always kind of very, very handy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. <laughs> and so he, he agreed with me. But then he said that the word insight is so established as a translation of Vipassana, we can't really change it now. But he, so I thought, okay, that's, that's a bit of a kind of a... You know, that's, that's too, too bad. But anyway, at least he agreed with me on this idea, which I thought was very interesting. And so there's these two sides of meditation, clear seeing yeah, 
and calm. Yeah? And they always come together. Yeah? These are not separate. Yeah? That's why I said they're two sides of the same coin. Yeah? If you have the heads, you also have tails. You can't have heads without tails. Yeah? And so two sides of the same coin. Yeah? And uh, so uh, what that means is that when we meditate, uh, yeah, we meditate always with these two things building each other up. Uh, and so you, when you become more peaceful, uh, and I don't know if you became peaceful in this very short meditation we had before, maybe you became a little bit more peaceful, even a tiny smidgen is good, right? So if you have a s tiny smidgen of more peace, that's already wonderful. Uh, and what you will see is that when the mind is more peaceful, uh, you tend to see more clearly. Uh, the mind has more power to it. Uh, yeah? There is less of the problems in the mind that block us from seeing clearly. Uh, and so clear seeing, always comes with calm. The deeper the calm is, the more clearly you will be seeing. And one of the ways of establishing that and making much of that is when you come to the end of your meditation, just like we did before, is to ask yourself what happened during the meditation. Yeah? How did it work? How did I become more peaceful? And one of the things you will notice is that many things have been abandoned in the meditation. I don't think so much. The body is kind of disappearing a little bit. And then you start to understand the things that cause trouble for you. Yeah, the things that are dukkha. Yeah, dukkha is the Pali word for suffering or for trouble or pain or whatever. All of those things are fading away. And this is one reason why I'm feeling more happy here. Yeah, so you start to see the connection between seeing clearly and the calm of the mind. They're very closely connected. The deeper the calm, the more clearly you will see. But it also goes the other way around. Yeah, it goes the other way around. The more clearly you see, uh, the more calm you will be. Yeah, why is that? Because when you see clearly, it means that you understand where suffering is, you understand where happiness is, and when you understand where suffering is, it is easier to abandon those things that actually are problematic. If you understand that the body is a problem, okay, it's easy to abandon the body during meditation. Yeah, it kind of makes sense because you know the issue, you know what is at stake. And so it is always, yeah, these two things always go together. The more peaceful you are, the more insight you have, or the more clear seeing you have. The more clear seeing you have, the more peaceful you are. And uh, the main reason why these things always must go together is because they have the same source. Yeah, the source for being peaceful is an abandoning of the defilements of the mind. Yeah, the less defilements you have in the mind, this is why we start with living a virtuous and kind lifestyle, because this abandons some of the defilements. It is also why the five hindrances, which is one of the ways of looking at the mental problems, why the abandoning of these things is so important. Yeah, the more calm you have, the less of these defilements there are. Why? Because calm is the opposite. Defilements is like, you know, ill will and desire. Ill will and desire takes you into the future. It takes you into the past. Uh, the less you have of these things, uh, the more peaceful you're going to be, the more you're going to be in the present. Uh, and so it kind of is it's natural to see that less defilements means uh, more peace. Uh, but less defilements also means more clear seeing. Uh, because defilements of the mind, desires, they bias, they distort our vision of the world. Yeah, if you desire something, you have a vested interest in the thing that you desire. If you have ill will towards somebody, you have a kind of anti-vested interest in that person, yeah, a rejection of that person. It biases your attitude toward, towards that person. And because these are biases, the less you have of these defilements, the more clear seeing you have. And so clear seeing, vipassana, and samatha calm, come from the same source, and that source is the abandoning of the hindrances, the abandoning of the defilements of the mind. Does that make sense? Am I making any sense here? Yeah? It makes sense to me, but I don't know if I'm able to kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, you always think it makes sense when you say it, but then people say, what is he talking about? Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so, and that's very, very fascinating, yeah? because once you understand that these two sides of meditation have the same source, it means that the path to achieving them, yeah, they, they must always come together, in, because otherwise that's kind of what, what it means to have the same source. There can be a little bit different kind of weight on the two things, but essentially they build up together. Yeah? And uh, the reason I'm talking about all of this 
is because what this shows you, it shows you one of the reasons why the jhanas, uh, these very deep states of meditation, are so incredibly important. Uh, yeah, because if the deeper the calm, the deeper the insight, it means that if you go all the way to very, very deep meditation, like the samadhi, like the jhanas, you're also going to have the deepest possible insight. Yeah? Makes sense, yeah? Because if the calm is very deep, the clear seeing is going to be very deep. And that is kind of the outcome of this. And so, uh, what does that mean? And one of the things that it means, and this may come as a surprise to you perhaps, I don't know, but one of the things this means is that the way the jhanas are described in the suttas, one of the descriptions is alang arya nanadasana visesa. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll translate for you. So this means uh, the distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Uh, yeah, distinction in knowledge and vision. Knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Uh, knowledge and vision, that is usually insight. Uh, that is usually about clear seeing, it's usually about wisdom. Uh, but here the jhanas actually have the same name as the highest stages of insight on the path. Uh, there are distinctions in knowledge and vision. Uh, isn't that kind of fascinating? What that means, it comes back to what I was just saying now, that samatha and vipassana, yeah, the idea of calm and insight all, always must go together. And the deeper you, the calm you have, the more profound your meditation is, the deeper is going to be your insight, the deeper is going to be your vision of reality. This is why these things are so incredibly fundamentally important. And this is why it matters so enormously that we get it right. I should have said at the very beginning, I forgot to say this at the very beginning, coming back to the beginning again now. <laughs> Sorry about that, just to be very brief. I, if we get the idea of the jhanas wrong, if we don't understand them in the right way, what that means is that we block our access to enlightenment, yeah, to the very end of the path, because we block our access to this knowledge and vision that arises out of these very deep states of meditation. So if we misunderstand these things, what they actually are, we have a very serious problem in terms of actually accessing that awakening experience that the Buddha himself was able to access uh, uh, when, you know, I was going to say during the night of his awakening. That's just another myth. It's not actually a night. It's more like an extended period. But, you know, as part of his awakening experience. And so this is uh, the idea of uh, jhanas from the point of view of samatha and vipassana. I'm a bit worried about the time because time goes so fast. I don't know why it is. Go slow time, please. <laughs> Doesn't usually listen to me, you know. Anyway, see what happens. There is another angle of thinking about the idea of samatha. And this angle is more the progress of meditation on the path. I like to call this the psychological viewpoint of meditation. In other words, an internal first-person viewpoint of meditation. Yeah. What does the meditation actually feel like? How do we experience meditation? Yeah? And uh, this is described in very many places in the suttas. Uh, one of the descriptions is called the dependent liberation sequence, uh, which shows how liberation happens one uh, factor at the time, yeah? starting from ordinary virtue all the way to awakening. Uh, there's a very beautiful sequence uh, that talks about all the mental qualities rising stage by stage. Uh, a very important sequence. It happens many, many places in the suttas. Uh, you have the sequence called the seven factors of awakening. Uh, this is a fundamental set of qualities found in the suttas. Yeah, it's a part of what is called the 37 uh, aids to awakening, which we are called, this is my teaching. Yeah? So these are part of that. Uh, uh, it is also found in the Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing. Uh, it is found in the six recollections. Uh, yeah, these are the kind of basic recollections to use to actually advance your meditation, to find joy in all of these kind of things. So it's found everywhere in the sutta, this particular sequence. And something that's found everywhere, you can take it to be of fundamental importance yeah, on the path. And so what does this say? Yeah, and what it says is the following. Uh, in the dependent liberation sequence, it starts off with sila. Sila is virtue or kindness or morality. From that virtue, you have non-regret. Yeah, this is the foundation. From non-regret, you get joy. Joy here is pamoja. Yeah, pamoja. From the pamoja, already you have joy. Yeah, from the pamoja comes piti. Piti is like rapture. Is a more kind of energetic kind of joy. Yeah, kind of waves of joy going through the body. 
From that rapture, you get tranquility called pasaddi in the Pali language. From that tranquility, you get sukha. Sukha can be translated as bliss, yeah? a profound, very satisfying state of tremendous happiness and joy, yeah? whereby you, know, you kind of, uh, you starting to feel that you're touching something very, very profound and beautiful. From that happiness uh, comes samadhi. And samadhi here is exactly what we're talking about before, the four jhanas, that is the samadhi we're talking about there. Yeah? So it comes from that joy here. And then from that samadhi comes yata bhuta nanadasana, which means seeing things in accordance with reality here. Yeah? Yata bhuta nyanadasana. Nanadasana, exactly the same what I was saying before. Alang arya nanadasana visesa. Yata Buddha Nyanadasana, same word, knowledge and vision, yeah, according to reality or, or uh, whatever. And if you look at that sequence, it is very interesting. Yeah? It is very interesting because it is, first of all, very so positive. Yeah? You have all of these words for joy and happiness. You have joy, you have rapture, you have tranquility, you have bliss, yeah? one thing after the other. Yeah? And I always say that uh, the reason why, Bud why, why not everyone in the world is a Buddhist, uh, I always wonder, why isn't everyone a Buddhist? Isn't that kind of weird? Here you are, joy, rapture, tranquility, bliss, samadhi. Everyone should be a Buddhist, for goodness sake. That's what I reckon. I don't kind of understand why everyone isn't a Buddhist. And when you read this kind of suttas, I think it's a marketing problem. That's what I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is marketing. This sutta is really good marketing, actually. There's bliss and all these kind of things. So we should talk more about bliss and happiness, not so much about dukkha. That's what I reckon. Too much dukkha talk in the world there. Anyway, so for me, this is really, really attractive. When I read this kind of, I think, wow, this is so uplifting here. Why haven't I heard more about this? Yeah, when I kind of, you know, travel around and meet teachers, my, my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, ha actually happens to talk about happiness all the time. And so I, I, I think that is the right way to do things. Of course, sometimes you have to talk about dukkha, but happiness is really undervalued as a teaching um, tool, teaching approach or whatever uh, on, the, on the Buddhist path. Uh. Now, so what, uh, what is so fascinating about this is that you will notice all of these states of happiness before you get to samadhi. Yeah? So, in other words, there is joy, then there is rapture, then there is a profound sense of tranquility, then there is bliss, then you get to samadhi, right? All of these things. And what that means is that when you start experiencing things, the samadhi, the jhana, is a very, very profound state. You have to go through all of these other kinds of happiness before you get to the jhanas. And this has implications for our understanding, our interpretation of these things. I'm supposed to talk about what jhana is and what isn't. I haven't really talked so much about that yet, but now it's coming here. Yeah, <laughs> now it's happening here. So uh, this has implications for how we understand the idea of jhana. One way that people often, and Venerable Chanda just mentioned it to me today, and I saw I should talk about, talk about that. Uh, um, she invited me, so I have to say you know, what she suggests, otherwise I'm not kind of fulfilling my duties. <laughs> and so she said that one of the problems often in, in meditation circles is that the way people decide whether they have achieved a jhana or not uh, is that they count the factors that are included in a jhana. And uh, in the suttas, very occasionally talk about what is called the jhana factors. Uh, in other words, the elements that make up a jhana experience. Uh, and those are five kind of elements, vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, and ekagata. Vitaka, vichara means uh, it can mean many different things. It basically means just the mind doing things. It can mean anything. It's very, very broad. It can mean thinking. It can also just mean the movement of the mind. Uh, piti, sukha means rapture and Bliss, as I was just talking about before, uh, in a kagata means like one-pointedness of mind. And that can also be very broad, depending on the context. Uh, and so, yeah, if you count those factors, uh, what that means is if you meditate and you experience a little bit of joy and happiness, uh, arguably you have all of those factors. Uh, and then people say, must be the first jhana. I say, wait a minute, it's not as simple as that, yeah? Because there's a long sequence of joy and happiness before you get to the jhana. So you have to be very careful. Huh? It is not any happiness that is jhana. It is a particular quality of happiness, a profound state of happiness that is the jhanas. Huh? And the way these are described in the suttas, they have a very kind of particular kind of description. Huh? And they are called the stillness of the mind born of... Uh, 
uh, the samadhi drop hit the sukha, the, the stillness born, uh, no, the <laughs> viveka drop hit the sukha, the happiness and joy born of seclusion, that is the first jhana. Yeah, so it's born of seclusion. And that seclusion in the suttas means the seclusion from the five senses and also the seclusion from the five hindrances. So it's a very, very particular kind of happiness. And this is then very important for understanding what these jhanas are. Yeah, this is kind of the beginning, beginning point uh, when you start to realize, actually, we have to be very careful. If we don't get this right, uh, we are going to block the access to awakening in the Dhamma. And so these things really matter here. And uh, so taking this a little bit further, I'm just going to carry on a few more minutes now. Um, taking this a little bit further, how can we approach the idea of what the jhanas really are in Buddhism? What is not and what is a jhana? And one of the ways of doing this, that is always the most powerful way, uh, is to remember, first of all, what are the sources of knowledge that we have available. Uh, the most powerful source of the knowledge uh, is the word of the Buddha in the suttas, the discourses. Yeah? Secondary knowledge is uh, things that teachers will say, yeah? teachers that uh, uh, you have some degree of confidence in that they have access to these kind of uh, meditations because they have the uh, personal qualities that suggest that they have deep meditation. Uh, but first of all, and then lastly comes your own experience, which of course also matters. Uh, so what does the Buddha say about these teachings uh, or about these jhanas? Uh, how are they described in the suttas? Uh, yeah? So they are described as uttari mandusa dhamma. Uttari mandusa dhamma means basically superhuman qualities. Uh, yeah? Qualities beyond ordinary human beings. Uh, that suggests that we should be entering something which is beyond our ordinary life, outside of our ordinary experience. It is the Alang Arya Nanadasana Vises that I mentioned before, the distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. That's a very powerful thing, worthy of the noble ones. The noble ones are people like, people like the Buddha. People like the Buddha, yeah, worthy of the noble ones. Or if you find someone very impressive in your life, someone you kind of really feel has access to very profound insight or whatever, these are the noble people in the world, uh, worthy of the noble ones. Uh, that is what these things are called. Uh, yeah? Another thing I should say before I go any further is that one of the suttas I mentioned yesterday, known as the Upakilesa Sutta, found in the middle link sayings of the Buddha. Are you familiar with the Buddhist scriptures? Uh, anyone? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, you are. Okay, good. Okay, excellent. Carry on with that. That's a good idea. <laughs> so the, uh, yeah, so the Buddhist scriptures uh, and the, one of these very famous scriptures is called the Middle Length Sayings of the Buddha. And it's a number, Sutta number 128 called the Upaklesa, that means the Sutta on the Corruptions of the Mind. Uh, there is a description of how you enter these jhana states. Uh, and uh, Anuruddha, one of the most foremost disciples of the Buddha, he tells the Buddha, well, we're having trouble entering these states. Yeah, we get these lights coming up in the mind and these lights are not stabilized. After a while they disappear. This is one of the foremost disciples of the Buddha having trouble entering these jhana states. Then the Buddha says to Anuruddha, he says that, well, actually I too, before my awakening, had trouble entering these states. So if the Buddha has trouble entering them, but then you have the jhana bros in the US entering these states at will, have you heard about the Jhana Bros? Because uh, this company in the US, it's a startup company in the US, they're kind of traveling around teaching everyone how to get into Jhana in kind of no time. Uh, and it's Jhana Bros. Uh, I, I, they, they were just labeled, I don't think actually that was what they called themselves, but they were labeled that kind of in, uh, by, by some, yeah. But uh, so this is kind of, then you know that there is a problem. If the Buddha has problems getting into these things, yeah, but the Jhana Bros find it easy. <laughs> Okay, you have a, <laughs> there's an issue here, yeah, something that needs to be done with this. So this is the kind of obstacles that we are facing in the modern world where people really overestimate what is going on. So the Buddha is having problems, right? These are profound things. Then the Buddha says that uh, this is also called the footsteps of the Buddha, the Tathagatapada. Yeah, this is one of, the, one of the words for the jhanas, right? Uh, now, if it is a footstep of the Buddha, it is not going to be something ordinary here. When you come to the jhanas, you know you are in the vicinity of the Buddha. That's the idea of the footsteps of the Buddha. You can see the track of the Buddha. You feel that you are in the presence of the Buddha because these things are so powerful. It's like otherworldly. You're entering a different realm, the realm of awakening itself as you come to these kind of things. 
It is called the Sambodhi Sukha. Sambodhi Sukha means the bliss of awakening here. It means that when you attain these jhana states, you are effectively very, very close to awakening. Yeah? The bliss of awakening, it is similar to the bliss of awakening itself. The jhanas are always spoken of together with the four stages of awakening. These are called like the Uttari Manusadhamma, the superhuman qualities, four jhanas and four stages of awakening, eight factors in all, always coming together like this. And so as you read the suttas, you start to understand that these things are not ordinary experiences. These are profound understandings of the nature of reality, have an aspect of nyanadasana, knowledge and vision that go with them, that actually then enables you. This is the culmination of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah, this is the last factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Samma, samadhi, right stillness of the mind, the four jhanas. This, you are at the threshold to awakening itself uh, when you come to these uh, particular states of meditation. Uh, that is how profound they are. Uh, and so this gives you a few ideas yeah, about what we are dealing with when we're dealing with jhana. Uh, don't fall for the uh, kind of the retreat. They say, okay, pay a thousand pounds and we guarantee a jhana. Don't fall for that, yeah? Promise. <laughs> because that is just not the way it works. Uh, if that is what you are told, you know it's not the real deal. There is a real problem there. They're overselling. And this is exactly what is happening with the jhana bros in the US. Yeah? They're overselling what is going on. It's not real jhana at all. All they're doing is taking your money. And they, actually, that's, that's it. Uh, yeah? So don't fall for these things. Uh, so be very careful, uh, be very circumspect. Uh, the Buddhist teachings are really, really profound. Uh, yeah? And it's important that we understand the profundity of these teachings, uh, starting with the profundity of jhana. And when we understand it in the right way, then there is a chance that we too can go all the way to the end of this path. Uh. That's all I'm going to say tonight. Uh. <laughs> so... Um, Promised Venerable Chanda to end around actually five minutes ago, but okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So I hope I haven't bamboozled you completely with this, and that you are still still okay with that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I this is I always think it's really nice to open people up for having a bit of Q and A, and if you want to comment on what has been said, or you have questions, or if, if the questions seem very basic to you, usually means it's a very good question. So please don't be afraid of asking really, really basic questions like "Why am I here?" Yeah, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, then we can maybe have a nice discussion. So uh, yeah. Why are you here? Actually, good question. <laughs> yeah, please. I'll, okay, excellent. How would you describe ego? So, how to describe ego? So, the ego is the um, the sense of self that you have inside of you. Huh? Yes, yeah, so the ego is the one that um, when someone says something to you that you don't like, yeah, the one that kind of starts uh, uh, starts justifying yourself or saying, "I'm okay. I'm you know, don't say that to me." Like that kind that part of you. That's the ego. Huh? So it is the, the feeling that you are somebody, uh, that you have certain qualities, uh, and then uh, you know uh, you get challenged and kind of you get upset and all of these kind of things. Uh, it, when you meditate, the ego manifests in the thinking. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed that before. When you meditate, you probably were thinking a few thoughts. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of part of the course. Yeah, you can expect to do quite a bit of thinking and meditation, uh, and that is the ego expressing itself usually through you know when you. Uh, and you see that very clearly in meditation. Then you, when you become peaceful, yeah, the thinking dies down. Uh, and then when the thinking dies down, actually, it's beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's really nice when the thinking dies down. Uh, and then you realize that the ego is a nuisance. Uh, that's kind of the beginning of understanding that the ego is a nuisance. Uh, a big part of the Buddhist path is to overcome yeah, these ideas of ego and sense of self and all of these kind of things. Uh, and you start to understand that during meditation practice. Uh, so that is the, uh, the ego is this thing inside of you that wants to be somebody. Yeah, I am this, I am that. And it takes on a certain uh, a shape or certain qualities that it wants to be. Uh, and it defends itself and it wants to become better and it wants to be the top of the world and it wants to kind of, uh, you know, and all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, so uh, don't believe the ego. That's kind of one of the first things. Uh, and then there's a chance that you will make some progress on the path uh. Is that what you wanted to hear, or is that uh, not what you wanted to hear? Is that, uh... I don't think I wanted to hear anything in particular. Yeah? I think it was a very good answer. Okay, you're happy with that. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Please, uh, yeah. Is, um, is there, John, a, a sense of got anything to do with purity at all? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So uh, I should have said much more about the state of jhana, actually. Yeah. So it is a state of uh, kind of complete purity, yeah. yeah. And so there's no, this is the idea of not having any defilements in the mind, yeah. So all any kind of uh, negative qualities, like you may call it desire, call it ill will, all of that is completely gone. Yeah. And so the mind is very, very bright, very, very powerful. Yeah. There's a feeling, uh, you know, there's a feel, this feel, yeah, very powerful feeling of purity, purity within her. Um, and because of that purity, you also feel incredible joy here. Yeah? yeah, that comes with that purity. So joy and happiness arises precisely because of that purity. Yeah? And then because of that joy and happiness and because of the purity, the mind tends to become unified. Yeah? And so a state of jhana is a state where the mind is completely unified. This is one of the, uh, one of the words for these experiences is, uh, is non-duality. Yeah? This is what you find, especially in the Hindu tradition, talking about non-duality. A non-dual state of mind is where the sense of observer and the object uh, has disappeared. So object and observer is one thing here. Yeah? And that's kind of, you never had that experience before, right? This is kind of completely different from what has, what has ever happened before. And uh, because of that, there are otherworldly experiences because we never had anything like that before. Huh? So this is all the things that kind of come together in the jhana. Many people think they are God. When you come into a jhana, yeah. So if you want to be God, that is the way to go, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and in the, from a Buddhist point of view, that's exactly the idea. Because when you come to these kind of states, uh, if you then get reborn later on, according to those states, you get reborn in a kind of very, very high, a very, a very a rarefied realm, uh, yeah, where basically you are very powerful, and you kind of you feel like you are God or whatever, whatever it might be. Yeah? So if you think you are God, then uh, it's, it's a good start, starting point, but it's not the end of it, yeah? because it's actually still wrong. You're not, not actually God, even though you might think you're God. Yeah? But this is the sense of uh, having credible powers and yeah? being very, very powerful, etc. Yeah? So all of these things come together there. Yeah. 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 So, uh, mm. please. Uh, yeah. So I have problems of this idea of, yeah. of grasping yeah. Jhana, uh, something aiming for uh, to balance it against acceptance. Yeah. It's sort of I, yeah. I don't know what to do with that. Don't know what to do with that. Okay. So what do you what you do with that is that you the, the way that jhana comes about is always by putting in the causes. Yeah. So come back to causes instead of actually looking for where you want to go, huh? and uh, you achieve what you. You achieve what the path gives you by putting in place the causes. And uh, what you're doing when you kind of get uh, excited about your meditation going well or whatever, uh, is the ego is kind of putting its little kind of fingers in there and trying to control things. Uh, excitement comes from the ego. The ego thinks, yeah, I'm going to get this. Yeah, And that's kind of the issue. It destroys the whole thing. So the ego is a serious problem. Uh, so remember that the causes are what matters, yeah? And you never know what's going to happen next as you practice your meditation. And because you never know, it's madness to have any kind of expectations, because you don't know. And sometimes by having an expectation, you're blocking out other possibilities. Because meditation is always a bit different. One day it may be very blissful, and one other time it may be more, have a different kind of flavor to it, more kind of compassionate or meta flavor to it. Uh, another day is peace that is kind of in ascendant. Uh, so it has many different flavors to it. And so once you have an expectation, uh, you're blocking out many of these other possibilities. Uh, so forget expectations. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, anyway. So just enjoy what you have. Enjoy what you have. Keep on putting in the causes and the main cause for meditation to happen is just being content. Yeah, whatever you have is great. Okay, this is beautiful. I'm enjoying this. Okay, maybe it's better than doing the dishes yeah? <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah, putting aside the whole world and just enjoying what I have now. And that is really the, uh, the path forward. Uh, yeah, so uh, forget this whole th expectation thing is terrible uh, and it's really, uh, really a bad idea. So, uh, yeah. So thank you for that. Uh. Please. Uh, but yeah. Just to go on from that, it, it seems to me that, say, if you've read Ajahn Brahm's amazing book, Mindfulness, yeah. Bliss and Beyond, mm. I, can't, I, I can't see how anyone could read that and go, oh, well, I don't, I'm not really that oh. interested, really. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so yeah. it, but 
is it not the case that you can have a, a some sort of um, sense of oh, wouldn't mind moving towards that so long as when you when you actually do the practice then you need to put all that stuff to one side so I'm sort of wondering if you can differentiate between the thoughts that you have when you not meditating and what's happening when you're you're actually meditating. Yeah. So, so you mean that you the way you use your mind is different outside of meditation compared to inside meditation? Well, what I'm saying is, when yeah. you're not meditating, if you read that book, say, or yeah. indeed listen to your talk, um, I would have thought it's natural, and, and in, dare I say, it, impossible not to sort of. I mean, it's kind of yeah. a conundrum because if you don't, you know, if, yeah. not, if you don't have any will towards it, then you're not going to do yeah. the practice, are yeah. you? You know, yeah. but but then at the same time, you, you don't want yeah. to overdo it or, or something. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that yeah. can you not have that um, those yeah. different it's feelings a, and yeah. vibes and things outside of meditation? So long as when you do yeah. your meditation, you put it all. Yeah, together. it's a difference in right effort. Yeah, right effort is six factor of the noble eightfold path. That six factor will depend on what you're doing here. Yeah. And so in, uh, in, all, in your daily life, yeah, you, you want to focus on living, living well, yeah, doing the right thing, yeah, treating people with kindness, uh, um, having compassion for people, understanding people in the right way. Yeah. And that should always be driven. In that case, it is driven by this idea that you want to practice this path because this path has good results. Uh, but don't, you know, don't think about jhanas, don't think about stream entry, don't think about these ends of the path. Just know that this path is going in the, in the you know, in a good direction uh, and just live well as a consequence. Uh. And that comes back to this idea of right view again, uh, right view, understanding what is really valuable in life. Yeah, this is kind of the critical thing here. When you have, the more you have right view, the more you will tend to do the right thing automatically. Uh. So right view is critical. Uh. And I'll, I'll give an example of how to have right view. And uh, because I think often we misunderstand, we think that the path to being kind and to being virtuous actually is having mindfulness, yeah? Because if you're mindful, you make good choices. Uh. There's some truth to that, but it's not the full truth. Uh. Because sometimes you are mindful and you still want to do the bad thing, yeah? Because your mind is defiled or whatever it might be. So sometimes it doesn't work. Mindfulness is not enough. Uh. Or sometimes you haven't got any mindfulness, yeah? You're kind of wandering around with your mobile phone, yeah? And you don't know what you're doing. And suddenly you say things and do things that are completely silly, yeah? Really bad idea. And so it is actually, you need right view to inform the mindfulness. That is the important thing. So right view is ultimately what is going to make you do the right thing. And so the example I like to use is, uh, say that you're going to cross a busy street uh, here in Brighton. Yeah? You come down to one of the main streets you're going to cross. Uh, and so you have two choices when you're going to cross the street. Uh, either you can just walk straight into the street. Uh, yeah? That's a bad idea, right? Usually a very bad idea. Or you come through, you can look, look left and right. Uh. Normally you look left and right, is that, is that correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah, normally, right? Yeah. And it doesn't matter how busy you are. It doesn't matter how much mindfulness you have. It doesn't matter how busy you are with your mobile phone. It doesn't matter if you're kind of, kind of talking to the mobile phone and doing anything. Yeah, you still remember to look left and right when you come to that street. Why is that? It's not because you have much mindfulness, because if you're with a mobile phone, your mind is kind of all over the place. It's because you have right view. What is that right view? The right view is that it's dangerous to cross the street without looking first. That is the right view. Yeah? That is what reminds you. And that shows you that right view is far more important than actually the mindfulness. And so when it comes to the practice of the spiritual path, every time you want to say something or you want to do something, the question should always, you know, the question, this is, you are, this is dangerous. In fact, this is much more dangerous than crossing the street. If you cross the street, you might die. Okay, it's a big deal, right? You kind of come up on the other end again. You can carry on your practice. So dying is kind of part for the course anyway. You've got to die, yeah? But what you cannot do, what you cannot afford, is to go wrong on the path. Because if you go wrong on the path, then you're heading in the wrong direction. You're making bad karma. You're creating maybe a bad future for yourself because of that. That is really the bad news. You want to create a good future. Death is going to happen anyway. Okay, so you die in the street or wherever. It's not such a big deal. But doing something wrong, heading the wrong way, that is really, really bad news. So if you have the right view, you should have more mindfulness every time you speak, every time you act, every time you think, than you have when you cross the street. Because actually, it is even more dangerous. 
That is what I mean by right view. Huh? Yeah? And so when you have that kind of right view, you start to become very virtuous. And this is why someone who is a Sotapanna, yeah, stream enterer, you know this terminology, right? This is kind of the first vision of the Dhamma. This is why they are perfected in, uh, this is why they have it perfected in virtue, because they have understood the Dhamma and they understand the danger of acting badly and acting wrongly. Yeah? And so they always act in the right way because their right view is perfected, not because their mindfulness is perfected. Yeah? And so we underestimate right view on the path. Uh, right view has this power to support everything that we do, starting with the virtue. Uh, also very, very important for mindfulness and for practicing meditation. Meditation is supported by two things according to the suttas. Uh, one thing is ujjukaditi, which means straight view, and the other one is sila, which is uh, the virtue or the morality. Uh, yeah? So it takes you all the way to the very end, and that is actually the, the, uh, the importance. So in daily life, coming back to your question, uh, in daily life, do the right effort which keeps the purity of the mind, keeps the purity of the conduct, whatever that might be. Yeah? So then, then there is that kind of idea of right effort, yeah? remembering the importance of the Dhamma, remember the jhanas if you like, whatever it, it is. But then when it comes to meditation practice, that is when right effort is different. Then you sit down, you let go, you direct the mind maybe a little bit. I call it nudging the mind because you don't want to use too much force. So you nudge the mind a little bit in the right direction. Okay, so I have a bit of kindness in my heart. I'm thinking, okay, I'm sitting here with all these good people. So I'm going to you know, have a sense of goodness by just being part of this community. Uh, you remember that the world is actually not all that interesting. The world is just full of impermanence, full of unreliability, full of wars. Yeah, we know that now. Yeah, full of wars everywhere, full of climate change, full of artificial intelligence. There's just one catas potential catastrophe after the other. And so after a while, okay, give it all up, give it all up. Yeah, come back to the come back to the path of uh, the spiritual path. Uh. So this is the idea again of a right view, huh? yeah? and so you do that. And so you nudge the mind a little bit, uh, but most of meditation is just to accept and to allow, and then allow those qualities that you have built up during the day, allow those to carry the meditation forward, uh, which they will do because you've done all of those things before. Huh? And that is how it works. Uh. And so meditation is about letting go. Yeah. How do you let go? Chillax. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, T, please. Sir. Um, so, uh, let's say uh, you know, we, uh, someone's meditating for many, many years, but they're not um, experiencing anything close to the jhanas. How are they to look, you know, regard this kind of, uh, yeah. you know, the situation. Don't worry about the. This is what I mean. Don't worry about the jhanas. Know they are there. Yeah, it's it good. It's good to know that they are. Just like we know that awakening is there. That doesn't mean that we are striving for awakening every time we meditate. Yeah, that would be crazy <coughs> if we do that. And so we just know that it's there. It's part of our overall view of reality or of the spiritual path. Uh, what matters is whether you are making progress in very simple things. Yeah, are you becoming more? Are you becoming a kinder person? Are you becoming more compassionate in the world? Uh, can you see that some of the defilements are getting reduced, you're getting less angry, uh, yeah? you're getting, having less kind of crazy desires uh, and these kind of things? Uh, that is what matters. Uh, so if you see this general tendency of the good qualities uh, going up and the bad qualities going down, that is all you need to look for. Uh, whether you are far from jhana or not, that's kind of completely irrelevant. Uh, just look if there is progress. Uh, if there is no progress, then of course there is kind of cause for I was going to say cause for concern, but maybe concern is the wrong word, cause for reflection. Yeah? So you reflect, why isn't it happening? What can I improve? Yeah? Where, where, is, where is things going wrong? Because it means that there maybe is a blind spot somewhere that you haven't seen. But that is really all you have to ask. Okay, six months ago, am I kinder and more peaceful now than I was six months ago? And if you are, then you know you're on the right track. Am I more patient now than I was six months ago? Yeah? Okay, you're on the right track. That is what you should be looking for. And this again is just the advice of the Buddha in the suttas. So, so uh, just to, uh, yeah, it's not just me saying random things, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. What do you consider to be your purpose? My purpose? Sir? <laughs> so uh, the, the purpose uh, uh, is... Uh, 
it depends what you're doing, but the, the purpose of, of life, yeah, if you want to think about the purpose of life, uh, is to find the meaning of life. Yeah? And the spiritual path of the Buddha is the answer to the meaning of life, that question of the meaning of life. That is why it is so powerful. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> and the reason for that, and one way of thinking about that, is that uh, according to the Buddha's teachings, uh, it's possible to come to a point where you have no more desires. Uh, all craving, all desires are gone. Uh, and if all desires are gone, it means you have complete contentment. Uh, if you have complete contentment, uh, there's nothing more to be done. Yeah, completely condemned means I can sit here forever. There's no way more to go. Yeah, I'm perfectly happy with the way things are. It means you have found the answer to the question of the meaning of life. And that is what the Buddha's teaching is about. That is what I think my life is about. Yeah, that is my purpose ultimately. Right now, my purpose is to give a Dhamma talk, uh, to teach a little bit. But that, even this Dhamma talk, uh, kind of falls into this larger purpose uh, yeah, of actually discovering the answer to the meaning of life. Uh, that is what Buddhism is about. And again, this is, I think, a, a marketing problem, that we don't actually market these really powerful ideas in Buddhism enough. Uh, it is really ultimately about the meaning of life itself. Uh, and a lot of people have a problem with finding meaning in life. They wonder, what am I doing here? Yeah, and probably with good reason. Yeah? Well, here is the answer. The answer is right there, uh, in front of you. Uh, yeah. I've, uh, I don't have too much awareness about Buddhism, but from what I've heard about yeah. Buddhism, it's not about the mind and thoughts. Is there much um, focus on kind of emotions and kind of how you'd, I don't know, maybe acceptance for your emotions or, yeah. like I heard somewhere, like, not too much about Buddhism, but the key to happiness is acceptance. Is it like, is it more key to accept your mind or accept your emotions or is there one that would be preferred? have more focus on maybe the emotions or the mind or yeah, well yeah emotions are an aspect of the mind yeah so they they, they go together in a sense uh, but emotions are incredibly important in buddha is really really important fundamental and uh, you know one of the very important meditation things it makes is called the uh, idea of meditating on loving kindness uh, and compassion uh, and that is really the development of your emotions uh, in a in a certain direction uh, and so the, the first part, accepting your emotions is, is kind of the beginning, yeah? So, okay, sometimes you may feel ill will or sometimes you may, you know, have all kinds of feelings going on. Uh, and so accepting that one has ill will is kind of also, is the beginning, yeah? Uh, okay, sometimes I will. It's okay, I'm a human being. So sometimes I get angry about things and that's all right. Uh, because if we don't accept what is going on, it's very difficult to do something about it. Uh, if we reject it, we try to force it out. Uh, it means that we already have a bias. We already have kind of a negative view of things uh, which will block us from seeing that thing clearly. Once you have a bias, you can't see things clearly. Uh, so accepting things means, okay, I have this anger. Now what? What can I do about this? Uh, and you will notice that the anger has certain causes. And one of the main causes is how we look at other people. Yeah, so you look at other people and you think, they have done something bad to me, so I, they deserve my anger. Yeah? But actually, that's kind of the wrong way of thinking, according to Buddhism. Okay, someone does something wrong against you. It just means that they are stupid. That's what it means. Yeah? <laughs> it's not really your problem. Yeah? It's their problem that they are kind of being silly and doing silly things. And the reason we get angry and upset in return is because we take it personally, but actually it's not really personal. It's just that person, their conditioning is coming out in a certain way, and because their conditioning is coming out in a certain way, they do something bad towards you, and that's all. And then you can understand that they are trapped by that conditioning, doing stupid things, and then you can have compassion for them instead. This is kind of the Buddhist idea of dealing with these things. And so this first step is to, as you say, acceptance. Okay, I have these emotions, it's okay. This is, I'm a human being. This is to be expected. Then once you accept it, you can see clearly what is going on. Then you can start doing something about it and you can start to transform the way you think about the world. And the critical thing here is really to understand things in a new way, understand human beings in a new way. And once you start understanding them in this new way, you can have compassion for them. You can start even to have kindness towards people. Yeah, you can start to see the good qualities in people. Because actually there's a lot of goodness in the world there. I mean, I noticed this as a Buddhist monk. I travel around a lot, and there's a lot of kind people in the world. Uh, and sometimes we, and sometimes they don't show themselves. They're kind of just doing their own little thing in the gardens, and they may not be Buddhist, or maybe whatever. Yeah, who knows what they are? Uh, uh, but they are still good people. Uh, and there's a lot of goodness in the world. Sometimes when you look for it, uh, you can see it. Uh, it is there. Yeah. And so then, as you build up this perception, you start to see things in a new way, you're developing your emotions in a very posit in a positive direction, uh, giving up the bad ones, uh, 
building up the, uh, uh, the good ones. Uh, and that's kind of gradually, stage by stage. Uh. Does that make sense? Uh? Yeah. yeah, are you sure? Uh, yeah, there's much more to it, yeah, but it's a kind of an introduction to how to deal with emotions a little bit. Uh. Yeah. Please, Chi, yeah. And Jan, you know, if you are able to access Janus, can it give you superpowers? Absolutely, of course, yeah, yeah. Heaps of them, yeah. <laughs> Which ones do you want? What is your favorite superpower? <laughs> what would you like to do? Walk on the water? Is that, is that good? Huh? <laughs> the most important superpower is the uh, remembering of past lives. Yeah, That's the most important one. Not teaching the Dharma. Teaching the Dharma. That's another superpower. That's true. Yeah. So, yeah. Big, well, first of all, remembering past lives because it gives an understanding of reality. Yeah. It gives an, an understanding of what life really is about. Uh, and that's why they're so powerful. Uh, and when you see your life in that kind of panorama going back into the past and then potentially also into the future, because obviously this is connected together, uh, it gives you a very powerful incentive to practice the path. Uh. So, that is number one superpower. Number two superpower is the uh, understanding the laws of karma, how this rebirth um, process happens. Uh, the third superpower is to become an arahant, yeah? the, the ending of all the defilements of the mind. That's the third superpower. Uh, the, four, the miracle, number one miracle, is a miracle of teaching. So if you want not just superpowers, but you also want miracles, uh, do you want like, miracles as well or just superpowers? Uh? <laughs> well, both. both, both, okay. <laughs> You should be more contented, I think. <laughs> so the, the, the miracle is, is it called the uh, Patiharya, and this is the miracle of teaching. Yeah, yeah? And this is kind of what I, this is what makes the suttas actually very down to earth. The word of the Buddha is so down to earth, because the Buddha talks about the, well, it is the, the miracle or the, um, the kind of special, spe the, um, the marvel of mind reading uh, uh, is one of them. Uh, uh, what is the other marvel? The marvel of mind reading, uh, divine eyes, is that, is that what it is? Uh, yeah? Or di yeah, maybe it's the divine eye. So the, divi the marvel of mind reading and the mind of the divine eye, right? Uh, and then there is the, div the marvel of teaching here. Yeah? And the Buddha says, forget about those two other marvels. The marvel that's the really amazing one. Uh, yeah? And the marvel of teaching is that when you teach the Dhamma to people, and the Dhamma is very profound because it has to do with overcoming the sense of self. Uh, the overcoming the sense of self is incredibly difficult because it's so deep-rooted in human beings. But when you teach this idea not to grasp, not to desire, and to overcome the sense of self, people can actually do it. That is the marvel of teaching here. So this is kind of the, uh, this is what I love about the Buddhist teaching. It is so down to earth. Yeah, forget about that mind reading stuff. That's kind of irrelevant. Yeah? Forget about the divine eye. That doesn't really matter. Yeah? What matters is these very simple things. Uh, when you read the qualities of the Buddha in the suttas, you know, you have the itipiso formula, itipiso bhagava arahang samma sambuddho vijja charana sampanna, etc. And uh, when you read this formula, and this formula is the way the Buddha recommends that we should remember the Buddha. Yeah, what are his qualities? Uh, and it's all about insight, understanding, uh, the Buddha as a teacher. Uh, there's nothing about supernormal powers. Uh, that is not what is important about the Buddha. Maybe he could read our minds, yeah, that's what it says in the suttas, but actually that is not really the point of the Buddha. The point is the insight into the nature of reality and also his abilities as a teacher consequent upon that insight into the nature of reality. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so the, the suttas are, the word of the Buddha is, tends to be very, very down to earth uh, and it tends to dismiss many of these things that people are interested in, yeah, for no real, in my opinion, not very uh, wisely being interested in all this kind of supernormal, marvelous stuff. Uh, okay, maybe it's true, but actually it doesn't really matter all that much. Uh. Are, you happy, are you content with that? Uh, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, please. Uh, yeah. At some point, you remind me of that question you asked at the end of our meditation. Yeah. Remind you of the question I asked? Okay, so yeah. So the, uh, at the end of the meditation, it is always useful to uh, go back if you feel a bit more contented at the end of the meditation, a bit more happy, a bit more settled. Uh, ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, yeah? Why am I more settled now? And the idea is to understand the process of meditation. Uh, 
And there's two things you will tend to find. One is that you have let go of something. Yeah? So you ask yourself, well, what have I let go of? And then you start to understand what letting go actually means. And what you will find is that letting go is this very, very simple thing. We think that letting go is something very profound and very difficult. But letting go often means just relaxing. Yeah, like, the, like the Buddha as a child under the Bodhi tree, not doing anything at all, just being patient, not doing anything. That is what letting go is. Not trying, not purposely moving towards watching the breath or holding on to things. That is the first thing you find. The second thing that you find is that uh, you have been able to point the mind somehow towards happiness or the enjoyment of meditation. Yeah? You found a way of enjoying the present moment. Uh, and so you ask yourself, well, what did I do? How did I enjoy the present moment? Uh, what is it that actually triggered that? Uh, is it because I remember some good deeds I have done in the past? Uh, is it because I felt blessed to have the Dhamma as my teaching? Is it because of the good company? Is it because I had a sense of gratitude? All of these things are ways of giving rise to positive mind states. And so you start to understand, yeah, especially these two things and, uh, and whatever else also comes in there. And then you, uh, it, it becomes easier in the future to, uh, to do it again as a consequence. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, yeah. Do I know you? I see, I see, like I recognize your face, or is that just a run? Is it a kind of fami face familiar to someone? It's from a past life. It's past life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe it is. Probably is actually. Yeah. <laughs> is that a claim of supernormal powers, or is it a no? Okay. <laughs> no? Okay. Yeah. Uh, pl uh, yeah. Please. I, th I think we should uh, probably uh, yeah. wrap up soon. Yeah. One or two more. Yeah. One or two more. Okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what you think about is what you're talking about do you do you think is compatible with a kind of political engagement in the world political engagement uh, what do you mean by political engagement uh, you mean like uh, being a politician huh? or, or uh, Are you, well, yeah? possibly <laughs> possibly yeah. I mean, okay. that's stretching it a bit, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Well, I suppose what I'm thinking about is what's happening in Palestine, yeah. and how 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 can yeah. we respond to that? Okay, um, yeah. from yeah. the position that, that you're yeah. describing. Yeah. Okay, it's absolutely compatible with political engagement, but uh, I would say instead of thinking of it as political engagement, think of it just as kindness. Yeah. What is the compassionate? What is the kind thing to do in these kind of very difficult situations? And uh, the danger with political engagement is the danger of taking sides. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so in Palestine, okay, so some people say the Israelis are to blame because the Palestinians are dying in large numbers. Uh, but uh, that, it, from a Buddhist point of view, is the wrong way of thinking about it. Uh, okay, so the, yes, the Israelis are killing Palestinians, we know that much. Uh, uh, but the point really is that if you think too much like that, you get upset uh, with the Israelis. Uh, and if you get angry with somebody, well, then you are kind of going against the way the Buddha is teaching the path. Uh, so much more important there is to try to understand yeah, what is actually going on. And what is going on is a conditioning of people. Yeah, the Israeli people who are doing this, whatever they're doing, they have been conditioned in a certain way, so they are trapped by that conditioning, and now they're doing these killings when they don't, probably don't have much choice. Yeah? The conditioning is so strong, it forces them almost to do that. And once you understand that the conditioning is driving someone else, then you can have compassion for them, because they are doing things that may be deep down they don't really want to do. I don't know about you, but I think most people understand that kindness is the way to being happy. We know that when you treat other people well, you tend to feel good about yourself. And when you know that, and then you know that someone else is doing something bad or something wrong, you know that they're creating suffering for themselves. Anyone who kills someone else, the person who actually has the most suffering is not the victim usually, but the perpetrator usually has more suffering in the long run because the perpetrator is creating enormous amounts of bad karma. They will feel terrible about themselves somewhere down the track. Whereas the victim, okay, the victim will die, but if they have lived a good life, they will still maybe have a good future afterwards. Yes, there will be grief in the family, there will be grief in the community, but in the long run, yeah, it is actually how you live your life is more important for your future than whether you are, you know, and you know, the victim or perpetrate any particular conflict. 
And once you see it like that, then uh, you can start to have compassion even for the perpetrators. Uh, because you know that they are trapped in a certain way. They're trapped by the views, trapped by the conditioning, trapped by the past. Uh, of course, you can have compassion for the victims, but even for the perpetrators. Uh, and then you start to have this uh, ability to uh, combine the spiritual practice with the also kind of political engagement, as you say. Yeah, okay, we should do our best to stop what is going on because it's obviously wrong. Uh, but also you understand that actually everyone here has, has a problem. Everyone here is uh, you know is worthy of compassion from one way in one viewpoint or another uh, something like that uh, yeah please uh, yeah um could you say a few words about working with restlessness aha uh -huh. working with it uh, don't work with it work against it no <laughs> <laughs> No, actually working with it is really the right word because working against is like fighting yeah which is not a good idea so uh the um uh, the thing to do is to try to understand why you are restless. Uh, and uh, usually it happens for two reasons. Uh, first of all, you're not enjoying the meditation enough, uh, so the mind wants to do something else, right? Uh, and that's kind of one reason. So if you can focus on enjoying the meditation, enjoying the little bit of peace that you have, uh, yeah, uh, that can already be very, very helpful. Uh, uh, the other reason uh, is because you are too interested in things in the world, uh, right? Uh, and uh, whatever it might be in the world that kind of occupies your mind. Uh, I think our smartphone habits uh, yeah, tend to kind of make us restless, yeah, because we are kind of always, we want to check up what's going on, or we want to just kind of see the, I don't, I, mean, I don't have a smartphone, so I don't, don't know, but that's what I'm told, yeah, it's kind of bad, it makes you restless. Uh, and so one thing to do is to take your smartphone and dump it in the ocean. Uh, yeah, that's kind of, a, that's a good point. <laughs> I don't know if that's possible for you, but uh, um, so, uh, Try to, so these, these are the two things, reduce your interest in the world, because the world just isn't that interesting, uh, find joy in the meditation. Both of these things will reduce the restlessness in the long run. Uh, if there are habits in your life that you know promote restless, uh, restlessness, uh, yeah, then try to change those habits very gently. Uh, don't use your mobile phone, I, I, I accept that people have to have a smartphone, uh, so don't use your mobile phone after a certain time in the evening, yeah? and if you can't stop yourself, put it in a different room, lock it up in a safe vault with a timer on it. You know, you can't open it up after a certain time or whatever. And so do things that support you, yeah, in, in that sort of way. And then maybe there is a, maybe there is hope, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so something about wanting things to be different to how they are is some of my restless. I don't really relate to the smartphone thing. Yeah, There's okay, okay. Like the gentleman's comment about yeah. the state of the world and things like that, that yeah. can cause a certain yeah. obstruction or agitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think your abandonment of the world is the sort of... That is the thing, you know, yeah. How to convince yeah. myself that that's actually truly... Well, one of the ways of doing that is to uh, ask yourself what creates your future, yeah? One of the things that we often try to do in meditation is we try to kind of solve problems. And part of that problem is the state of the world. Yeah, you can, it agitates you, how can this be resolved? And you're trying to find solutions. Also be solutions in your private life. There are issues in your life. And when we meditate, people tend to think this is a great time to solve problems. Yeah, this is kind of very common in meditation. Uh, but the, so the question is then, can we really solve those problems? And the answer, from a Buddhist point of view, is actually no, because yes, even if you solve one problem, there's another one waiting right behind it, uh, and it goes on like this forever, and that's why we're still here, because we've been solve, trying to solve these problems forever and ever before. Uh, and uh, so the answer is just to understand that there is no future in that world. Uh, yeah, there is no kind of the future, just means more of the same, going round and round and round. And that is not how you create your future. You don't create it by resolving all the problems. The way you create your future is by practicing the spiritual path. That is how the future comes about. So if you want to have a good future, regardless of what happens with the climate, regardless of what happens with wars, regardless of what happens with artificial intelligence, regardless if asteroids come and impact the earth and everything blows up, regardless of everything, the way is the spiritual path. Yeah? And then you are building up those qualities that will ensure, first of all, resilience in this life, and secondly, also a good future in terms of rebirth and all of these kind of things. So that is where the future is created. And once that kind of starts to sink in, 
Why think about it? Yeah? Then just be peaceful, enjoy the meditation, and allow the spiritual qualities to grow instead. Huh? Yeah. Something like that. Huh? Yeah. John, may I ask one question? It's up to Venerable Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the, the Dhamma Bros or the Jhana Bros. Jhana Bros, yeah. Do they promise certificates with the, with the Jhanas and the... And the... <laughs> they, they promise a very steep price. I think that's pretty much all they, all they <laughs> promise. Because <so, yeah. laughs> yeah. I've seen some now giving yeah. certificates of, of attainment. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is a sign of straight away, <laughs> shun it straight away. <laughs> kind of, yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah. We should, uh, yeah, uh, we're already over, over time actually. Yeah. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so, so how do you want? Should I speak? Say yeah. something first? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for the talk. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, that was really wonderful. It's yeah. so nice just to hear pure dhamma about practice, <laughs> about meditation, and yeah. just incredibly rich. I don't know about everyone here, but I've been. A Buddhist, I guess, for 28 years, and I still will listen to that many times. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot in there. So. Yeah, good. Okay, so thank you so much for that kind, those kind words. Uh. So what I just wanted to finish off by saying that uh, the reason I'm here in uh, England is uh, in part, of course, to teach the Dhamma, which is, well, that's kind of the main reason, of course, because that is what everything, all, all this is about. Uh. But as part of teaching the Dhamma, I'm also here to support Venerable Chanda in her effort to establish a monastery for nuns, for bhikkhunis, fully ordained nuns here in England. And as she said before, this is the first such project in the UK. And uh, I don't know if you are aware of this, but this is a very important thing for a number of reasons. Uh, reason number one is because it opens up the possibility for women to take full ordination in the same way as men have been doing for two and a half thousand years. Uh, yeah, women, it kind of died out for a while and now it's trying, kind of starting up again. And uh, giving women that opportunity to practice the spiritual path fully is one reason. Uh, and the second reason why it is very important, I think it's very important also to hear women's voices as teachers, because uh, teaching the Dhamma is always going to be a little bit different depending on our background and our conditioning. Uh, and so hearing the Dhamma teaching from a man and from a woman is going to be slightly different. Uh, and so I think it's very important to have that we support the idea of building up again a, a women's Sangha, women's monastic community in Buddhism. Uh, according to the early Buddhist teachings, there are four pillars or four assemblies, uh, yeah, four uh, uh, groups of people that are important to keep the Dhamma going into the future. Those four assemblies are the monks, the nuns, yeah, and the nuns haven't been around except for now we have two of them. Uh, this is really unique. You have no idea how rare this is, yeah, to have two nuns in the same place. Uh, and the lay women and the lay men, yeah, the four assemblies. And when you have those four assemblies, then the Dhamma is considered strong on a firm footing here. And if you don't have those four assemblies, well, then there is a weakness in a sense in the Dhamma. It's like an, this, this traditional saying is like an elephant with only three feet. Yeah, it kind of doesn't really walk all that well with three feet. Yeah, so the Dhamma has a similar kind of problem there. So it's wonderful that um, Venerable Chanda is being one of the pioneers in this regard. Uh, it's very difficult to be a pioneer because you have to establish everything from scratch. Uh, very difficult to find support, to find people who are interested. Uh, and so for that reason, I would uh, encourage all of you, if you have the opportunity to help out, you have to support in whatever way you can uh, and see if we can kind of establish a real women's sangha and a community of bhikkhunis also here in England, in the UK here. And what a marvelous thing that would be. So that is my encouragement to all of you. Huh? So, uh, yeah, that's it. So, Venerable, please. <laughs> okay, yeah, so just a few ways about how you can be involved, because part of this, of course, is bringing teachers like Ajahn Brahmali across, and we bring Ajahn Brahm across most years. And of course, I do a lot of teaching as well, and Venerable Apeka is here, also contributing to the teachings that we do online. Um, and I guess this is the first step in a sense, but we need more people because there's so much demand to hear the teachings and, you know, a lot of misunderstandings too about what is a very subtle and profound path. And um, for this reason, I think it's always been important and it will continue to be uh, important to have people who can dedicate their whole lives to the practice, to the whole Eightfold Path. 
you know, into serving as well, because this is one of the ways we express our understanding and we deepen the purity of mind that allows us to really enter these deep states of meditation and see things as they are. So we've already achieved a huge milestone in establishing a monastery, thanks to the help of hundreds of thousands of people, I should think, around the world over the years, you know, some contributing a little bit, some a lot, whether financially or time-wise or support-wise. Um, but really, the idea of a monastery is not to have a building. It's actually to grow um, people who are established in the practice. So it's to grow community and it's also to grow other nuns. So we want to have like a non-factory <laughs> because, you know, one or two nuns can't do the job of teaching the Dhamma to so many people. We always have far too many invitations worldwide to teach retreats and uh, online and in so many other ways, you know, at schools or prisons or whatever. We just can't keep up with it. So, um, you know, to keep these teachings going, we need support and also to give opportunities to everybody here to... Um, come and practice with us, you know, come and uh, come for a meditation day, come to stay in the monastery as a guest and experience the monastic lifestyle for yourself. You know, we have a morning where we serve together, we do little jobs around the place, and then afternoons where we practice in solitude and we try to live in harmony together. And uh, there are other ways you can be involved as volunteers. You've seen all our wonderful volunteers here. They've, many of them have been involved for like eight or nine years now, and uh, they've grown with us. We're all growing together in the Dhamma. So. And we have online events too, so there's lots of ways you can be part of this. And uh, yeah, we have leaflets over there and opportunities to give in whatever way you can. So I hope that we'll see you somewhere else soon. And uh, thank you all re very, very much for being here, especially um, Corky over there who helped us to hire this place and has invited us so warmly with all the refreshments and the tea, which I think is still available, I guess, is it? Yeah, afterwards. And yeah, just to all of you for your enthusiasm, you know, for the Dhamma and your wonderful questions, which I found really, uh, really, really interesting. So. Ah, maybe we should end with three big sadhus. Uh, absolutely. This is, this is uh, a party course. word you can remember uh, yeah. quickly. It's called sadhu. Yeah. The word is sadhu. And it basically means fantastic, excellent, well done, wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I don't, I don't In Australian. That, yeah. So. so <laughs> we, yeah, we should say not all, we should say sadhu though, not awesome. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so sometimes they say awesome these days. Oh, but, really? but actually, we, no, we no, stick no, to we sadhu. Stay yeah, yeah. With the Pali. So are you ready? Saying sadhu? Do okay. As big as you can. Sadhu. 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 But Ajahn Brahm always says you have to go ha 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 at the end. Ha, ha, ha. It doesn't work. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do ha ha ha. Really? Yes. That's the ha ha yana, is it? I think it's, it must yeah. be, yeah. Okay. <laughs>